Buenos días. Eh, bienvenidos. Welcome. Thank you for your attendance today, especially because I know it's early. And it's too early, in fact, it's inhuman. And I'd like to thank especially, particularly those who did networking yesterday. So uh, I'd like to thank you twice for that. And well, in any case, this is going to be really pas uh, interesting. And we will not deceive you, disappoint you. So. We have three experts this morning, and we are going. <coughs> we're going to talk about infrastructures, and it's going to be very interesting for all of you. We're going to talk about issues related to infrastructures, with really new topics, new threats, and we're going to look towards the future. What, like the really more pioneer things that are being done and also the next steps to come. So I believe it's going to be a very beautiful session. I'd like to introduce our three experts very quickly because I think the most important thing is for them to tell us about what they know and we're going to have brief presentations because we also want to have a Q&A session at the end. So, without further ado, I'll like to introduce Pilar Martín Peinador. She's representing AENA. She works in the airport, Madrid Barajas Airport. She's head of APM. Pilar studied engineering, very special engineering, and aeronautics in Madrid. She's worked in consultancy in St. Jones in the implementation of SAP in energy and also later in security in DECON. And she's the head of the section of APM in the airport of Madrid, in the Madrid Barajas airport now. So then we will give the floor to Mr. Tony Cash. He's a PhD in chemistry and he's representing the Bale Industry Fire Association. He's the international president of that association. He's got over 30 years of experience and he's worked a lot in security, mainly the fire, security and he's worked in many different areas like public transport he's been the head of security in the underground in London also in tunnel construction in pharmaceutics he's worked in aviation civil and military aviation and many other fields and he's also worked in regulation and also research he's a member of and sometimes president too in the main international institutions related to security institution of fire engineers british standard in the uh, institute fpa international and then finally we'll give the floor to mr aurelio rojo a very close friend of ours of ours he's a studied a PhD in industrial engineer and he's worked in safety and protection against fire uh, mainly in the subway in Madrid where he was director of operations and he was responsible of over 300 kilometers and over 250 stations of the subway I hope you managed to sleep <laughs> tight at night in spite of all that responsibility. He is a member of AMIS, the Latin American Association. He's been the general director and now he's the chairman of APICI. And well, I would also like to highlight that he's uh, 
professor in the Masters of Railway in the University of Comillas. And uh, that's all. I'd like to give the floor to Pilar now. Thank you very much. Buenos días. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Mafre for uh, having extended an invitation to me. It's the very first time I have been invited to such an event. It was a great surprise, and uh, I'm really enjoying this. And it's uh, a great opportunity to tell you about our automatic transport system for passengers. We call it APM, Automatic People Mover, and we have this in the airport, in Madrid Barajas Airport. It is a really key infrastructure in the airport. Before I start describing the APM and the different, co the different components, I'd like to show you the general um, plan of the airport. So you have the different terminals there, T1, T1, T2, T3, the new terminal T4 and T4S, the two new terminals that were built during the last, last uh, extension of the airport. And then there you have a clear blue, a light blue line, and that's the APM. So T4 and T4S were built, and then, of course, the APS was necessary to move passengers from one area of terminals to another. So there were, uh, we needed a system with a high capacity, with a high level of service, safe, safe and comfortable. The distance was relatively short, about two kilometers, and the time had to be limited, and with uh, quite a lot of frequency. So we thought about the bus, uh, mobile system, and then finally APM. And we chose the Novia system, APM 100. And that's the only uh, single and first system uh, of this kind in Spain. So it is a totally automatic system without driver no drivers, and it is an infrastructure within a bigger infrastructure. So there is an underground tunnel, the one you can see here, and this is the TSA. So there are two levels. In the lower level, we have this STA or SATE, STE, and this is for luggage, and then there's another the upper level with two roads for lorries and vehicles and then in the middle we have the um, APM. This TSA system can support the weight of uh, planes on, on the above, on surface, so it's quite a singular infrastructure. There are Trains are, have three vehicles, 60, 76 passengers per vehicle, maximum, uh, the time of travel is three minutes and a half, maximum, maximum speed is 48 kilometers per hour, and a total capacity of 6,500 per hour. Uh, passengers per hour. Here we have all the maintenance area. The two, there are two stations, one in T4 with lateral uh, loading areas, and then the satellite one. And then there are many changes here. And this allows us to have a uh, great flexibility. As for the stations, I'm sure you've seen that already when you visited it. So, T4 satellite. And then here we have the doors, and they are automatic doors made of glass to guarantee the safety of passengers so that they cannot uh, go to the uh, railway if the train is not there. 
There are also panels for information, also speakers performing every five minutes of the time. They have to wait until the next train will arrive, and there's also a button to call the train. This button can be pushed, and that's for periods when there's not much demand. But there's also as an automatic system that detects the presence of passengers in the area. And then the train comes. So here we have the fixed um, infrastructures, and here we have the maintenance area, the very big area, 11 square meters. It's level minus two of the T4 terminal. Here we do all sorts of operations and maintenance tests, and cleaning, uh, light and heavy maintenance. And the vehicles arrived in 2006, and we do everything there. So we didn't need to send them anywhere for repairs or whatever. Here we have the energy supply to the rails. There are five electric substations, one in each of the stations, and then another three that are situated uh, on the rail, so close to the rails. So we have fire protection there. Here you can see the area of the control room. It's similar to the one uh, used for subways. And this is where we do all the monitoring and controlling of the systems. We can register the trains and send them. And we also control all the different systems, PDS for energy, you don't see the panel here. We also receive all the alerts from the system. Here, we have a scheme of the trains. Here, we also have cameras, so we can see the arrivals and departures of the trains. So, you know, everything that can be done from the control center. Here, you have the, in, a view of the tunnel inside. This is an infrastructure without a driver. And therefore, it was considered that for emergency situations, the best idea was to build a, an emergency area for pedestrians on both sides of the rail, and that's the same level of the floor of the vehicle. So it's um, a sort of platform, a footbridge. There's special emergency lighting for evacuation. This is additional lighting so that the tunnel will be well, have more light in case of emergency and in case of passengers having to evacuate, be evacuated. So there is fire detection by fiber laser and fire extension systems and there's a extraction, uh, the smoke extraction system is also controlled by the control center. If the firefighters need to get into the infrastructure, well, we can see then at each exit, you have all this equipment that you see on the slide. And you can also cut the energy of the affected area of the railway. So here we have the characteristics of the fleet. We have 19 vehicles. It's a structure of aluminium and steel, maximum safety and resistance to crash, uh, safety glasses, so ex de fire detection systems and fire extinction systems in every vehicle, also special emergency lightning. There's also a system that will guarantee that uh, known passengers will be blocked inside. And there's also 
a safety system that uh, allows for the vehicle to be opened manually during the while the train is moving. So if this is an operation, 24-hour uh, operation, but it is adapted to the needs, the demands in the airport. So we have four hour, hours and a half at night here, for example, this route. In red, we have the railway that is being is subject of uh, to maintenance operations. So in green, we have the one operating. So those going from satellite to T4, um, both di directions are using the same railway. While usually we have this other operation scheme, a normal loop, what we, as we call it. So we're doing the loop here and having the two different directions. So we have the peak hours for trains in valley time, valley period of time, two trains and flat period of time with three trains. When we have two trains, it's low demand. So there, the train only starts doing its itinerary if it's cold. Here, you can have the volume of passengers and kilometers covered. For the year 20, up to 2016, it had, uh, mm, we had carried over 10 million passengers. And then, of course, we should add the number of workers and crew that have not been added to this amount, to this total figure. And then over uh, 1 million kilometers covered. In order to of guarantee the greatest quality, we can say that we have uh, complied with INOR's standard since 2008. So we have this certificate of the Spanish uh, standardization organization, INOR, and we renew this every few years. So here we have some indicators uh, that allow us to value our operation. So we have the opinion of passengers and general users of the APM. We got a score of 8.76 out of 10. We asked about the operation of the service, so 9.12, nearly 10. Safety, also very high uh, score. Also the information about the service and the fact that it's comfortable, that's where we got the lowest scores, but over for eight. Availability of the service was of 99.85% up to 2016. Here you have the annual availability, as you can see, very high. And the average is, as I say, 99.85%. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and that it is interesting for you. Thank you. And later on, we will have a common Q&A session for the three speakers. Now I'll give the floor to Tony. Good morning. Where's the interpreter? because I can't hear much of your Spanish at the moment. So, buenos dias. <laughs> That's the best I can manage. I did try some more, but it wasn't the best Spanish at all. Um, thank you very much indeed to MAFRE. Um, it's been a phenomenal conference. I hope I don't spoil it now by what I'm going to tell you. Um, so, I'd have to turn this to Spanish then to know when you're finished, because I can't see you. Are you, can you put your hand up? Are you tucked away behind? Oh, there you are, lovely. So I'm going to take this out, and if you have a problem, just wave, OK? So if you want to stop the train, you wave anything across your body. If it's really bad, you wave your hands across like this. And uh, if you remember the film, The Railway Children, 
Did you see the railway children? Put thumbs up. Are you listening? Uh, did you see the film, The Railway Children, with Jennifer Agata? You have to take your red knickers off and wave them to get the attention of the driver. That's just for the ladies. Gentlemen, I know that Flamenco was good yesterday, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, so, first of all, a little thing about the Rail Industry Fire Association, who was very uh, kind to allow me to come and present to you this morning. Uh, we are a completely voluntary body. We have no government funding. We have a very, very small subscription. If anybody is individual and wants to join, that's 50 euros. Uh, British Airways was in the room. I see the power went down. <laughs> and if anybody has a corporation and wants to join, it's 400 euros. Um, and we have our annual general meeting in London on the 14th of July. Um, then a little bit about myself. Um, I was very recently appointed infrastructure director for Trenton Fire Limited. It's an independent company of 25 specialist fire engineers and 40 risk assessors. Um, I liked the opening presentation. It gave me the concept of using our little postcards. Um, so we're going to send you a postcard from my travels as I have your business card address. Um, so that's a very nice little backdrop. Now, first of all, um, we all speak in different languages. So the first thing to do is to understand what the definition is of safety and how does it differ from security. So what does safety comprise? And what has happened recently? Because as you know, we're not living in very simple times now. We have to consider risk and we have to consider what our first primary purpose has been. So in the previous employment at London Underground for 10 years, our single purpose has been to move passengers from one place to another, and the only value is time. So here are two definitions for you. The dictionary defines safety and security in two ways. Safety first, the condition of being protected from or unlikely to cause danger, risk, or injury. And security is the state of being free from danger, or I've underlined it there, threat. Can you see the difference between the two? Oh, I want to go back one. Can you see the difference between the two? What is the difference between the first and the second one? Only risk. So what is risk and why is it important? I don't expect you to see the right-hand slide. The right-hand slide goes back in time. The right-hand slide shows the scale of risk in 1988. And next year will be, my mathematics isn't really up to it, but I think it's 30 years since 1988. Any arguments? Then it's 30 years. So what we have is the chance of dying, depending on what you do. And the greatest chance of having an accident is putting your socks on, getting out of bed in the morning. In terms of risk, the safest is aviation travel at the bottom. This was one death in 2,500 million journeys. So that is, if you want to die in an aeroplane accident, you have to go 60,000 orbits of the Earth, okay, or distance to the sun and return. And we heard yesterday in the risk presentation on aviation how it is improving and the impact is the difference because it's the society concern. I'm going to show you two quite disturbing pictures which identifies that the impact makes the impact, okay? Which of those two do you think is the higher risk? Can you put your hands up if you think the one on the left is a higher risk than the one on the right? The one on the left, okay? And who thinks that the one on the right with the train in the tunnel is the higher risk? Okay, it's very tight, so we get a hung parliament, just like the election. <laughs> and the one on the right with a train stored in the tunnel is the greatest risk. The reason being, it's quite warm here today. In the tunnels, it's quite regularly 44, 45 centigrade. If a train is held in a tunnel for more than two or three minutes, 
the temperature inside would get to the point where the water in your head would start to boil and you begin to lose your consciousness. So that's the biggest risk. Fire is not such a great risk. Which of these two has the greatest impact? So we're going to take a vote again. You recognize the one on the right is uh, the Compostela de Santiago accident, yeah? So it's very close to your hearts in Spain. The one on the left was in northern England with a train crash, which was caused by poor maintenance. An engineer not paying attention to a very simple task, which caused a derailment. So the one on the left-hand side was a human factor maintenance error. The one on the right-hand side was overspeed. The one on the right-hand side had a subsequent fire. The one on the left-hand side was simply a derailment and not many persons were injured. So you can see two very similar events. They have different outcomes. Now we move to another part of the insured risk. So yesterday, um, we know MAFRE works in oil, gas, petrochemical, power generation, schools. And when you look at a refinery, the question for you, is this place any more or less risky than an operational railway? Who thinks it is more risky? Show your hands. You can come to more harm in a refinery than on the railway? Yeah? Okay. It's true. This one has a railway at the back and has uh, the risk for the refinery operator is the fire service wanted to close down the refinery because they hadn't paid attention to their fire engineering. They had all the equipment, but they didn't have a sufficient water supply. I was talking with uh, our next presenter about water supplies in the metro. So you have to take a general holistic view. So we look at emergency planning and construction. Um, the right-hand side is where I went to college. Yeah, those aviation people can see that uh, that's the third floor. And in the United Kingdom, it's generally accepted that you're safe on the first two floors. If you're on the third floor of a building, then some special arrangements have to be put in place for your escape. This is not the way that we like to escape from buildings in the United Kingdom now. We have to pay attention to fire engineering and make sure that we prevent the outbreak of fire in construction. On the left-hand side, we see the um, construction of the new ticket hall at Victoria Station. This is where you would start your journey to Andai and Irun many, many years ago on the very elegant Orient Express, or now you would have to take the ferry or the tunnel. So here, we really took apart a whole quarter of London. And it was very important to keep the workforce safe and also keep the railways running. And the only way to do that is by exercising desktop exercises, visits by the London Fire Brigade, who is our regulatory force, and tunnel team emergency training. We have, at any one time, working on the Underground Railway, two or 3,000 people digging, some by hand, and some using tunnel boring machines. The level of safety has to be the same for every individual. And the emergency drills includes one very unusual exercise of um, rescuing the so-called Tunnel King. The Tunnel King is the one person who has authority of all the construction work. And if something should go wrong and the Tunnel King becomes ill, then everybody's uh, at risk. In terms of incident management, in construction and in use, we have different arrangements for safety. It's a very good idea to speak the same language in railway terms as the emergency responders. So when we do our command and control, one of my jobs was to be the subject matter expert in the command centre. So Pilar showed you command centre. We have the same structure. Um, and it's to coordinate 
So we copy the police, fire, ambulance and London Underground in the three levels of command and control. So everybody knows what their purpose can be. And this just gives a very quick summary. All it says, this is gold, your strategic. One person from each agency is overall in charge. If you're silver, then you're at the tactical stage. You are close to the incident. And if you're bronze, then you're working right at the coal face. So in the last few weeks, we had unfortunate attack on Westminster Bridge that involved Westminster Jubilee Line underground station being closed. Subsequently, there was the attack in Manchester that involved Manchester Victoria Main Line station being closed for two and a half days. We had the further unfortunate attack at London Bridge and Borough Market and that involved London Bridge Station being closed for four days subsequently. And all of the individuals in charge play their role. And for a protracted or lengthy incident, it's necessary to send some of these people home early because they will be working the next day. So on the day of the Westminster accident, when I went to London Fire Brigade, there was nobody in because they all had been sent home because they knew they would be having to undertake the recovery next day. So the people on the scene must be rested so you have a changeover. And sometimes this person here just tells these teams what to do. And if you are in strategic command, sometimes you have to be told what to do by the tactical command. So you cannot be possessive of your function. So the message I would leave you with, plan, rehearse, review the rehearsal, rehearse it again, review it again, rehearse it, rehearse it, and rehearse it, and write it down. If you want to see the full story of this, this was an uh, exercise which cost as much to organise as I believe this beautiful conference. So we uh, gave homage to the Skyfall movie. Do you all remember the Skyfall movie? There's a scene where the trains collapse into the basement of MI5. That was computer graphics. And we did the safety, I was the safety officer for that one. But because we wanted a little bit of fun and excitement, we gave eight train carriages to the London Fire Brigade and we recreated in a power station the exact same scene of Skyfall. So when you go to your websites, go to Google and look up Exercise Unified Response. It's the best week I ever had because I knew how it would end, I had to leave the country so that the exercise would run and only the people with the outcomes would be tested. So they exiled me to Berlin for one week. Um, but it was a lovely exercise, many lessons learned, and hopefully some fun. Now, we heard about cyber risk, so I show you to end with a picture of my typewriter. And if you have challenges, as Mafre was saying, I would like to invite you to buttonhole me with your challenges. That means to do this. So when you see me, you buttonhole me with your challenges. And please write to me here at trentonfire.co.uk and consider joining RIFA. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Tony. Well, uh, pues sin sin más dilación, vamos paso a Aurelio. Two, we're going to give the floor now to Aurelio Rojo. Buenos días. How are we doing with time? Uh, we, we're running out of time, and a friend, we're a bit late. First, I would like to thank uh, Matt Frey Global Risks and the ICMAP for uh, inviting me to be again with you, here again with you. Truly, 
hace muchos años. Y this is a relationship, an ongoing relationship uh, with the CMAV and MAPFRE professionals, which has been going on for many years. We started working together in the underground uh, network of Madrid and also in APIFI, where we set up uh, seminars and studies and we uh, enjoyed a common uh, learning process. At the presentation, I will be referring as a start uh, to risk analysis. What I'm really going to do is to tell you uh, about different experiences, different experiences and uh, forms of implementing uh, security measures in the underground that every year more and more in big cities, uh, underground networks uh, which are very much under pressure, the, the underground system in Lima, Bogota, Mexico, uh, 2,000 people can be at the same time inside a station and the security measures should be uh, pushed to the limit. Uh, at some relevant uh, fires we've learned a lot, uh, that's something else I'm going to refer to. And we learned through uh, simulation tools, engineering tools, which uh, become very necessary for design but also for the operation of underground systems in a uh, secure manner, learning and uh, assessing the risks which are going to be the immigration times, the critical point uh, is going to be very important and which have been the active systems in terms of uh, fire protection that we found as the most adequate ones for the underground environment of uh, uh, and then some simulation examples for immigration in stations and trains. So around these, what is it that we see? We see a chaotic situation. We see uh, the pictures above. They are taken in Caracas, in Venezuela, operating in uh, normal conditions, you may see that the flow of uh, passengers is uh, quite intense. So, in case of any uh, variation factor, a panic situation can be created. So, the situation should be control, kept under control, keep information on what's uh, going on, and from the, the headquarters, the staff should be ready to uh, front any difficulty appearing. On the row below, you may see a picture from the uh, sub city, uh, from the suburbs of Sao Paulo, and you may see people uh, running and jumping over the tracks. So, when there's a rescue situation, we do not know what's going on. We may panic, and in this case, the people there are forming a stampede and running against the other side of the track, but by crossing it. So when panic situations uh, occur, human behavior becomes unpredictable. Which are the risk, risk situations you can come across in the underground? One of the most important ones, of course, is fire. But there are many more, as you may see here in, in this slide. There are terrorist attacks, there are uh, uh, problems of uh, flood, uh, of flooding underground, uh, explosive atmospheres because of the of gas leaks, uh, or leaks from a petrol from, from petrol station or in the area of an airport, for example, the building of the underground line at the beginning there were leaks from the deposits which were which are no longer there, but the area in where line eight is there's a full monitoring on atmosphere because of the area being impregnated with uh, fuel. So those systems are still working. And also uh, collapse uh, of uh, the ceiling sometimes because of the piloting of bridges or, or 
penetrado en el túnel, incluso en algún tren automático, como en Lyon, pues una zona loca de estas que hace pilotes, entró en el túnel y rebanó el tren automático. The tunnel and cat over an automatic train which was carrying passengers. So we've got to uh, make forecasts uh, on what uh, may happen. Flooding is relatively frequent, uh, uh, sometimes in the underground, underneath uh, the sea. Then, uh, Pumps should be working at all times because otherwise the underground may become flooded. Let's look into some relevant fires. We've got uh, uh, information from the beginning of the 20th century at the Coin Station in Paris. There was a fire, uh, an outbreak of a fire out of a short circuit in a train. The train was uh, evacuated, the passengers left, and the train. Uh, became stuck in a tunnel and created a big amount of smoke. Uh, curiously enough, the passengers who died uh, died because of out of the consequences of the of the train, which got stuck there, and the passengers who had been even had been evacuated were not brought outside. And the references in the literature say that they stayed there. He stayed asking for a refund of that ticket, and about 80% of the people that they were just protesting because they wanted their, their ticket to be refunded. So, 80 people died as a consequence of the smoke uh, coming from the fire of the train, which had become stuck in the tunnel before. So, in the case of the fire uh, at King Cross Station in London, Tony knows it very well. There was a fire at one of the staircases uh, on one of the sides of the station, and um, at a certain stage, an explosion took place in the staircase. It was an old uh, wooden staircase, but there was still uh, service being provided at the other lines, so and there were people coming in and out out of the main hall. And uh, when the uh, firemen were arriving, uh, lacking some information, they went to a different access. The explosion took place, and 31 people died, and uh, the security authority and the inspection authority of transport did a relevant report, which has been the guideline on what should be done with regards to uh, emergency situations prevention, prevention in underground stations. Uh, it was a 100-item uh, report. So we started researching into uh, prevention systems, so we set up nebulized water systems uh, as one of the fire prevention elements. One of my colleagues pointed out before that there should be a full coordination from the control uh, office of what's going on on the different lines in a very mesh, a very thick mesh uh, underground grid. Uh, what happens in a line affects the rest of the line, so you cannot make decisions just taking into account the line being directly affected by a problem. Here in Baku, uh, in the former Soviet Union, in Georgia, there was uh, an electrical fire inside a train, and many of the people uh, who died there died once they had been evacuated in the tunnel when they were about to reach the station through which they were going to go outside. We're talking about uh, some 800 meters, uh, and the control point changed the uh, ventilation flow. So the people who were about to leave and who had not come across uh, smoke were completely suffocated 
with the smoke created because of the change of the ventilation and more than a hundred people died because of such change in the management. Getting to know the management of uh, ventilation and the decisions uh, made is very important, we'll see, and we'll look into that later on. The fire uh, which affected the underground grid of Daewo in Korea at the beginning of 2003, in this case it was a, a case of vandalism, it was someone who had uh, been fired from the underground services and he spilled a flammable liquid and put fire to it. The people in this uh, uh, train were evacuated but uh, uh, wrong management of it allowed another train to uh, stop beside the, 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 the train on fire. And the train here you may see the people inside the train, the driver requested uh, instructions to the headquarters so instead of uh, counting on a protocol he had to wait for instructions and to add on, on top of that when he was going to open the, the doors he mistook the button and he could not open it so more than 200 people died and most of the victims uh, were people who were stuck in that other train, as in the case of Baku, the operators and the train driver were processed and they ended up in jail, so at the personal level uh, this entails uh, criminal responsibility because of personal or professional acts. In the case of uh, provoked fire uh, in Cruz del Radio station in Madrid, there was uh, one of the seats, uh, newspaper, a newspaper was uh, inserted underneath uh, the cushions. This was in 1990, there were old wagons and they had wonderful foam seats. And uh, a series of teenagers uh, introduced uh, some newspapers and put fire to them. And uh, uh, the air fan, the outlet fan, was right underneath that seat. And when the driver tried to put uh, off the fire, which was not uh, very big at the beginning, could not uh, put it off because the ventilation system was uh, feeding it with air. There was no smoke detection system at that time. So the fire. Uh, grew in the train and before the driver activated or acted with the extinguisher uh, some uh, travelers had acted on the emergency brake and so half the travelers were in the station and half the travelers were in the tunnel. The security uh, recommendations say that if the train is either in a station or below a 10 km per hour speed, the emergency brake will uh, brake, but if the brake is uh, uh, acted upon when the speed is higher, it warns the driver that the train will reach the next station because it, uh, it is a uh, uh, situation considered to be safer because there's not much time in between stations, it's only one, two minutes. In this case, it had uh, got uh, s stopped and that people could be uh, evacuated through the station. And according to security protocols, the opposite train uh, stopped right before uh, the area where the problem had taken place. And uh, uh, the travelers in this train were evacuated, and uh, uh, some of the travelers had to be taken care of because of smoke uh, inhaling. And uh, as we analyze uh, situations, the influence meant uh, 
having the fan and the ventilation on and this would be the, uh, the smoke load. So this is an important diagram and you may see there that uh, this would be the temperature reached when no kind of ventilation is acting. This is a fire in the tunnel with a fire load of around 2 to 4 megawatts. According to different hypotheses, and what we see is that the environment cannot be kept, and the big temperatures have, uh, are reached depending on the distribution of the tunnel. The smoke cannot be controlled through ventilation and can take a different direction depending on pressures and overpressures appearing. But if ventilation is started with either normal flow or emergency flow, uh, this is a direction in which the evacuation should be taking place and uh, the, according to this diagram, depending on the uh, fire load, you may see the speed, uh, the airspeed which should be infused in the underground in is 2 meters per second, so we question should be done uh, opposite to the emergency ventilation. We assessed different uh, uh, trials and we modeled different situations according to uh, fire uh, within an underground. In this case, it was uh, by modeling fire on uh, starting from uh, backpacks full with clothes. We may see two different details such as uh, visibility. Uh, the smoke uh, dissemination temperature and heat transfer speed, which is very important in continuous trains, such as the Boa trains used in the uh, underground of Madrid. In the simulation, in this trial, we may see that the fire in the uh, backpacks uh, became self-extinguished but the dissemination of smoke all throughout the car and the amount of smoke were the true problems. Uh, so a fire which did not uh, finally break out uh, had very important effects so that's why we set up nebulized water systems which among other functions, other uh, abilities, they can control and decant the smoke all throughout the cars. We did this in Madrid and the ground some 12 years ago. Studies are being made right now. There are commissions at which uh, our friend Tony is uh, participating uh, while defining the regulations which should be put in place at the European level in order to implement active extinguishing systems and smoke control systems. So, nebulized water system means using a system with which uh, short water volume, in the case of uh, trains uh, with just 100, uh, 300 liters uh, through uh, the implementation of high pressure systems through very small droplets, you can put off uh, fire because of the characteristics of nebulized water and uh, because of its uh, abilities in terms of uh, heat transfer abilities, uh, heat absorption properties. And um, after a series of uh, trials we did with the ISOMAT, uh, at uh, its lab laboratories in San Agustin de Guadalix, uh, taking into account uh, staircases uh, and whole scenarios have become, all this has become a, a world scale reference uh, for the implementation of security measures in, for example, uh, stall rooms, cloak rooms, uh, technical rooms, as well as in the cars. We may see. where uh, you can find located a 300 liter compartment in the train. So maybe a nice uh, water system inside the cars where the people are and also in order to control the smoke and also possibility to implement nebulized water systems in the lower parts of the cars. There you have some examples of uh, uh, people movement uh, simulations which on the one side 
tell us where in stations the biggest uh, uh, cluster of, clusters of people form and uh, this is important for the station design looking into uh, places where bottlenecks appear or maybe seeing where the bottlenecks take place uh, where the evacuation uh, takes place and uh, at the stations in low visibility conditions even we have the conditions of uh, emergency, emergency lighting allows uh, for the evacuation of the stations. We may see another example of the evacuation of our station. We assessed the timings and we saw where the critical points uh, appear. So we should be careful not to place vending machines or introducing any modifications in the station structure. So these are different simulations that you may see the evacuation of our station, also assessing where the uh, two critical points are. We may also look into the automatic guiding systems, which are already insta installed in some stations. Some of my other private speakers uh, mentioned that when a train, when a car is uh, stopped inside a tunnel and when there's no clear information, we start uh, smelling the smoke, we start uh, getting worried and sometimes, sometimes the self evacuation system takes the uh, phenomenon takes place. So and, and control evacuation takes place as no instructions have been given on which are the ways out. It is very convenient that such uh, uh, signs are there uh, tell the people uh, which should be the way, the adequate way out depending on their ventilations. This happens also in, in road tunnels because no way the way out when you still do not have clear which are decisions made from the control uh, point is very important according to or depending on their ventilation uh, conditions. We may see the self equation phenomenon. People can jump up to the uh, tracks. We may see evacuation, controlled evacuation uh, processes with uh, evacuation uh, staircases all through the corridors, as has been mentioned before. As you may see, uh, you can come across very complex situations and the implementation of uh, operation support systems and engineering studies makes us to count on ever uh, more and more secure systems and risks are well under control and for operators it means uh, being able to pay a smaller prime because of the system being protected, which is quite convenient for the owners of this system. Thank you. Much, Aurelio. I hope that will be the case. You will have you will have a reduction in your insurance costs, but don't forget you should invite us to these conferences too. We have a couple of minutes left for questions if there are any, and otherwise we will just give the floor to uh, the following session. Please use the microphone for interpreting. Aurelio, I have a question about what you mentioned. Or, um, boring with the drill in the underground and that could lead to problems. And I've seen situations when I was uh, monitoring works uh, hired by insurance, uh, an insurance company and then I found tension no issues in line two in Bilbao, for example, or line two in Barcelona underground, because of works that are being carried out in the surroundings. Shouldn't we have a sort of 
protocol of all the sort of works that could have an impact on the underground so that we can guarantee that there should be some sort of specific surveillance for the works carried out in the area. Well, in the case of Madrid, and then there are other situations like the cities in uh, Latin America where we don't really know the what we, there is in the underground. But in fact, usually, when a permit is given for works to be carried out, for infrastructures or for a building, I can tell you that, well, we have a good system and everybody is well informed about the level to which the works can be carried out. If that kind of thing, well, if that kind of situation actually appears, is because of a problem with the works. Well, sometimes there is a relationship, a close relationship with the works and what happens, for example, in the case of the tunnels of the M30 road and the underground stations, well, there uh, the, it was a really complex situation and there was a close surveillance. But when we're talking about works in private buildings and things like that, it's a bit more difficult for us to uh, guarantee the surveillance because it's difficult to know that someone could go deeper than they should take into account that the underground is there. Well, there have been two or three events of the sort in our case, but no problems. But in the case of um, uh, uh, an automatic case because there was a machine that was boring it and the one I presented and it actually you know it really affected the underground the vehicle what you say it's there but it's difficult in terms of implementation so my function for London Underground was to control all of the works and if it would help you, just email me. I will send you back the process of how we controlled the works for above ground and surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you have a question over there? Well, it's not one question, but two for Aurelia and two for Pilar. Aurelio, your nebulized water system, I suppose it's with an automatic system, is it? Well, these sort of systems of nebulized water systems, they can be activated manually or automatically. If the temperature is very high, there will be an automatic activation. There's usually an early detection system always, and this means that we can detect the fire before it's even visible, for example, in escalators and things like that. This means we can intervene very early and we can achieve extinguish, extinction of the fire very early pretty early and for example in escalators that we may have like three or four events a year but just two hours after the alarm sets out the escalators will be working again operating again so these systems as we have are used with the manual activation but there is an additional system that will detect uh, high temperatures and then activate those nebulized water systems um, automatically. But in any case, in our protocol we have 
the manual activation and then an automatic activation for later on. Aurelio, Pilar, please be very brief with your answers because it's, uh, we're already in the second session, actually. Okay, in case of fire in a, tun in a tunnel, the evacuation should be done in the opposite sense of the entry of the water, uh, airflow. How do the passengers know the direction they should follow? Well, in Madrid, in our underground, according to the protocol, it's always an assisted evacuation. This means that we have the driver and also the PA system. But I do believe that the automatic direction light would be very mm, useful also for automatic undergrounds. When some because there someone needs to go from the station to the area of the event to do the evacuation. For Pilar now, the system you have with, you mentioned it's with laser, but you, for detection of the fire, but you don't have an automatic extinguishing system. Well, in the tunnel, we don't have an automatic extinguishing system. We have uh, the extraction and controlled through the other tunnels where the roads are. Well, up to now, no problems have been, we've had no problems really when there have been some specific fires or whatever. We've used the extinguishers that are in the vehicles and then we've used the ventilation of the tunnel. Do you have a fire? brigade in the airport for that, or do you have a special fire bri brigade for that? Well, in this specific case, it was the people from Bombardier who are in charge of the operation uh, and maintenance. It's them who arrived to the site in just a few minutes, so one of the members of the team use the extinguisher from the vehicle to extinguish the fire. We have never had a really serious event with uh, the firefighters or anything. We've had to evacuate uh, smoke, but we've always used the ventilation system of the tunnel. Okay, thank you very much, and now we will give the floor to the following roundtable.